Okay, let me start by describing the main items here. We have the map on the right hand side, of course, which is the obvious bit. Down the left hand panel, we have all the different tools and functions that um, are available. These um, expand, you just need to click on the different uh, icons on the far left and you'll open the different tabs to do different things. Um, the search bar and some extra buttons are along the top left hand uh, header bar and in the right hand header bar there's this key drop down menu here which I will come to in a bit. I just want to flag that it's there at the moment. Um, before we get started there's one clarification that follows on from what Laura said. When you take a subscription to Digimap for Schools you get one username and password for use by everybody in the school. So you can share it with staff, you can share it with pupils, you can even share it with parents if you want them to help with homework and so on. Um, do beware that they use it for educational purposes and for their schoolwork rather than for nice things that parents like to do, which is all part of the licensing. I just have to say that to make it very clear. Uh, the passwords for the, the password change have not yet been issued. They will be issued on the 28th of September. So don't panic if you don't have your new password yet. If you forget your password, please just contact our help desk and they can help you out. So I'm going to start by doing a search here. I'm going to start by searching for Edinburgh. Um, Forgive the bias in our place names here. They're places that we know and places that we find are useful to illustrate particular points. So I'm going to type in Edinburgh in the search box in the top left hand corner and click the search button here. As you can see, we get two different lists. We get places in the UK and we get world places. So as with many places in this country, there are duplicate place names across the world, especially in places like, um, like the USA. So here we have Edinburgh City in Scotland. I just need to click on the entry in the list and it will zoom the map directly to the place that I choose. If I click on the world place names, let's choose Edinburgh, Indiana, and you can see that we get Edinburgh, Indiana there. Let's go back to Edinburgh City here because the OS maps are what I really want to show you. You can remove this list of search terms by just clicking the little black cross in the corner. That will also remove the marker, although your map will not move. We have a zoom bar here on the far right hand side, which you can either just click and drag up and down to change the scale of your map, or you can use the um, plus and minus buttons underneath like this. If you are using a tablet, you could use a pinch zoom in and out, which is fairly standard behavior for a map. What I would say is be careful you don't pinch the green frame around the map because that can end up zooming too much of the application and it can get a bit muddled. Just make sure you stick the zoom within the map itself. I have a mouse here with a scroll wheel, so all I'm doing is scrolling in and out with my, my mouse wheel there. You can sometimes on a tablet also do a double click to zoom in, which is also quite useful. So from my search term, I get a map of a particular, particular scale. As you can see, I can zoom in and out of the maps and the scale of the map will change. And the map itself changes according to the scale. So Auden Survey produced maps that are designed to, to be visible and acceptable and legible within particular scale ranges. And when we get outside those scale ranges, we have to change the map product we're using, otherwise they become not very pretty and not very usable. So as I zoom in here, you can see I get through to the very, very detailed data and where we've got the edges of pavements, we can see individual monuments and so on. That's as far in as I can zoom on this one. But as I zoom out, of course, this level of detail becomes illegible at uh, smaller scales. So we start to see a different product, which does a degree of generalization on those um, building outlines. And we can see things a little bit more clearly. We do lose some detail, obviously, as you zoom out, you will always lose some detail. But if you were teaching generalization, this is quite a good way to go about illustrating the point. As we zoom out a bit further, you can see we get the one to 25,000 map, which is what you might know as the paper explorer maps. It's just, this is just the digital equivalent of those. Zoom out a bit further still, and we get the digital equivalent of the one to 50,000 land ranger maps, the pink ones. And zoom out a bit further, we get to road atlas style mapping. And a bit further still, we get to different sort of road atlas <laughs> mapping right out to a much more uh, simple, much simpler map, which shows even less detail, but gives us a much better overview of a larger area. Once we get to these green maps, we're then looking at what we have as a global map. So this style of map covers the whole globe. Um, it is a single image. 
So you can pan left and right, up and down, north, south, east, west, and you will eventually come to the edge of the image. So it's unfortunate that with, um, as with Google Maps, you can scroll all the way around. We, we can't do the scrolling all the way around the world because what we have is a single image and it has edges. As you can see, I can move the map, click and drag to move to wherever I want, and I can move anywhere in the world like this. I want to show you also this little button underneath the zoom bar on the right hand side. It's a zoom to maximum extent. If I click that, we can see that the map will zoom right out to see the whole world. It's a very tricky thing to get the whole world visible on a screen. The amount of map you actually see will depend upon the resolution of your screen and the size of your screen. So if you have a very small tablet with a low resolution, you mind you'll see much less of the world than if you have a very large monitor with a very high resolution. So going back to our search terms, we can also search for um, things like landmarks. So I can search for Mount Everest and I click return and it will come up with Mount Everest. As you can see, it's there. I can click on that and then I can zoom in on the area there. Once we zoom in further on um, the non-UK lo locations, we find that we have not the Auden survey mapping, obviously, because OS only covers Great Britain. Um, we get to um, open source mapping, this is open street map, which of course has a different level of detail and is a different style. Um, in very remote places like Mount Everest, there isn't much detail to see, but if we were to search for say the Eiffel Tower, we will see much more detail. Click on that one and I can zoom in here. And as you see, as I zoom in on the Eiffel Tower, we get a much, much greater level of detail. Um, the de detail at, it, in this data set varies depending upon the location in the world. It's sourced from a crowdsourced data set. So it is put together and created by people who are interested in mapping and interested in the particular area that they live in. And as a consequence, there are some areas of the world that are very, very detailed, like this one. Uh, and there are some areas where there is very little, um, very little mapping. If I show you Paris like this, I'll search for Paris and we'll get the places UK and the places world. I'm going to look at the world places to show you some some interesting um, ideas. So if I click on Paris, France, you can see that that's a level of detail is really quite significant. It's as good as what we get in the UK. If I was to pick Paris, Texas in the USA, there's much less detail. So the road structure is there, but actually the only bit of detail about the buildings is the city center. If I pick Paris, Kentucky, I get the same thing. The road structures are there, but actually there's very little detail about the individual buildings inside. I can go through Paris, Tennessee and find the same thing. Paris, Illinois, same thing again. But Paris, um, pr France, of course, which is the capital city, contains a lot more detail. So if you're looking at global places, places elsewhere in the world, do be aware that the level of detail may vary. Um, and it depends really on, on the level of interest in the mapping community at large, how detailed um, those maps are. So I'm going to hit this start again button here, which is the little uh, circle one at the top. This will wipe everything clean and set me right back to the beginning. What I would say is that you can't break this. You can click on anything, it will not break. If you get stuck, hit the start again and you go right back to the beginning. You may lose anything you've already done if you haven't saved it, but if you're really stuck, that's the way to go. So I'm going to start now to show you some of the drawing tools. We're going to start by finding a school. I'm going to look for Newton Grange Primary School here. You should find that most schools in Britain are listed in this gazetteer. There are some, of course, some that are new or some that have moved, which won't appear, but for the most part, most of them are there. So I'm going to click on this one and it will find the school here. And close the search, um, search results and I can zoom in on the school here. As you can see, my little school appears right in the middle. I'm going to zoom in so we can see the detail. I'm going to start by showing you some of the measurement tools. The measurement tools appear in the left-hand panel here. It's the little set square icon. We can firstly do a distance measurement. So I click on the distance radio button at the top, and I'm going to start just by measuring the perimeter of the school fence like this. I'm going to generalize this just for speed, but I just click and drag to change direction. And then when I've finished, I double click. And as you can see, I get a little tool tip that gives me the distance of the line I've drawn in meters. In the left-hand panel, it gives me both metric and imperial measurements. These measurements are temporary. They won't print. We'll come to the printing options in a minute. 
I can do the same with the area. So if I wanted to measure the area of my school building, I can do exactly the same thing this way. Click and drag and click and drag to change direction. I'm going to be a bit rough and ready with this for speed reasons. You can be as precise as you like. New Peter style, double click to finish. And as you can see, the tooltip here will give me the area of the shape that I've drawn in square meters. Similarly, in the left-hand panel, it gives me both metric and imperial measurements. If you're measuring a large area like a forest or a national park or a country, you'll find that the, um, the acres and the kilometers squared, uh, that the units change according to the, the area that you're, you're looking at. Since these measurements won't print, they will stay on the screen until I remove them. So for clarity, I'm going to just delete these measurements here. I click the delete measurements radio button and hit delete all and the measurements will disappear. Next, I'm going to show you the drawing tools. So we start with the drawing tools here, which is the top tab on the left-hand panel. There are a number of drawing tools, and when you select one of them, you will find the extra options open underneath. If you're using a tablet, you may find you need to scroll down this panel in order to see all the options. For example, when I open the markers tab, we get a whole range of markers here and some settings and more options that fall below those. This is an inevitable consequence of trying to provide lots of functions that they, they will drop off the end. So do remember to scroll down and have a look if you can't see what you think you should be finding there. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a marker for my house. You can pick any kind of marker you like. The younger children love the smiley faces. I'm going to stick with a simple balloon here. And I'm going to mark my house here. I'm going to change the... Uh... No, I'm not going to change anything at the moment, sorry. I'm now going to draw a line which will allow me to measure the distance between home and school. So my line is here. And I'm going to come out of my front door, take my route to school. Again, I'm simply clicking and dragging in order to get the line to change direction and I double click to finish. The select button is down here on the left hand side. I can click that and then run my mouse over the line that I've drawn until I get the little hand. Click that to turn it yellow. This means the line is selected. Any of the options here on the left-hand side will now apply to the line I've selected in yellow. So this one I'm going to change to make it red, and I'm going to make it a dotted line, and I'm going to make it quite fat so that everybody can see it. So I've made my line settings here, and then I click anywhere on the map to unselect the feature that I've selected. I can then use the measure tool up here on the top line, and I can click on the line that I've just drawn, and it will give me the measurement in meters. If I want to select the, um, the measurement itself now, I can just click on the text itself and you can see there's a little yellow circle, which is the anchor point. I'll leave the label as it is, although I could edit it if I wanted, but this will allow me to change the text to be larger or smaller. So I can change the text so that it's a different color. I can change the font like this. And then again, click anywhere off the map and it will um, make those settings take effect. If I wanted to draw the measurements that I'd done previously, I'm going to click the shape option and I'm going to measure again the area of the school. So again, I'm doing this quite roughly just for speed. This will allow me to draw the shape around the perimeter of the school. Once I've done that, I will be able to measure it and label it with the measurement. I'll go like this. There's my shape. That's my school building. I can then click the measure tool again in the top bar here, click on the shape that I've drawn, and it will give me the measurement as an area in meter squared. While that shape is selected in yellow, I can also change the line and fill settings to change its color. This one I'm going to change to green. So it's gonna have a dark green edge, and I'm gonna give it a pale green shade like that. There we go. If you wanted to expand this into something a little bit more um, advanced, you can add your own um, your own data set to the map. So rather than have every pupil add their own um, home location individually, you could construct a, a simple spreadsheet uh, of data points of, of points of um, of locations with a label and then upload those all at once. Let me show you what I've got here. Um, I have a small Excel spreadsheet, which I hope I'm going to be able to open here and show you, which looks like this. 
This Excel spreadsheet has two very simple columns. It has a grid reference column and it has a label. Instead of using grid references, you could use postcodes, you could use um, eastings and northings, and you could use latitude and longitude. Either will work. The headings need to be slightly different and all the details are given in our help pages, which I will show you in a minute. Once you've constructed your spreadsheet like this, it has a label associated with each point. I'm going to close that for now. And if you want to add those points to your map, you need to go to the Add Data button here, click Browse, select the file that you've um, created, click Open, and then click Import. As you can see, all the little points that I have in my spreadsheet have been uploaded to the map all in one go. So for example, you might want to do this with your class locations. You could do it with anything, actually. This is a, a useful example to do it with where people live, but you could do it in many different contexts. But this would then allow you to, to have conversations about how uh, far away things are, how long it takes to get to, to, to different places. This particular example, you might want to explore the different options for traveling from home to school. So you could draw lines from um, from people's front doors and which route they would take to school like this. Or you might want to do as the crow flies. You might also want to have conversations about how um, the route might vary depending upon whether you go on foot or by bike or by bus or by car and have conversations about distances and, and so on like that. We do have some learning resources, which Laura will send you later on in along with the recording relating to a class travel map and other distance measuring options. There is also a learning resource about the daily mile, which talks about how to measure around your playground to see how many laps of your school playground you might have to do in order to run a mile before school every morning. Um, it's the intention is to get children to uh, brighten up, to wake up properly, lots of oxygen to their brains so that their learning is a bit more effective. Um, if you then wanted to print the work that you've done, we have a print button at the top here. Oh no, sorry, I forgot one thing. Um, let's talk about adding images. So if I wanted to add an image of my school to this map, I can click the image button here and I click on the map itself to give it an anchor point, click the browse, and then I can find the photograph that I've got to upload, click upload, and there is the photograph I've added. I can then click and drag this around so it forms the right, goes to the right place on my map. I can also move the anchor point if I want, if I've got that not quite right. So this way you can make things fit as you as you so wish on the map. Let's for a moment suggest we want to print this. The print button is in the top uh, header bar here. So we click print and we get an extra window up. This window has three main sections. It has a left-hand panel that gives you all the options. You can give your map a title. You can add your own name to it, put my name in there. You can either have the exact scale that you're seeing on the screen, or you can round the scale to something a bit more sensible. Um, it's entirely up to you. It depends what you want. If you change the scale, you may find that the area on your map changes a little bit too. It shouldn't change too much, but that depends on the scale of your original map. You can choose a print format. PDF is good for just printing out and handing out. If you wanted to copy and paste your map into or insert it into a PowerPoint presentation or a Word document or something else, you might be better off having the JPEG version. We can go up to A3 in size. A4 is usually sufficient, and you can change between portrait and landscape. You can add, choose to include your drawings, or you can take the drawings off. That button there does not remove the drawings from your map on the screen. It simply removes them from the print file, so they won't print. So we can add them back again. If you add the national grid lines, you will find the map is ever so slightly smaller because we have to allow some space on the paper for the, the labeling of the grid lines. If you want to print a legend, that comes out as a separate um, on a separate page. On the right hand side here, we have two tabs. There's a content preview and a layout preview. The content preview will show you what the map will actually look like. The layout preview will show you the area it covers. So adding images to your map like this picture of the school can be misleading. Um, the image doesn't actually come out covering that much of the of the map. So you have to take this in a little bit of faith. But you can move this map around to make sure that the blue square covers all the annotations and the drawings that you want to include on your map. So the content preview stays the same, but the layout preview will give you an, an idea of the area. When you hit generate print file at the bottom here, this goes away and it will print, uh, it will generate a, a, a digital file for you. 
It does not send it to your printer. So there's no chance of you using up printer credits or ink or paper without first checking that what you've got is going to work. So in this example here, I can see that my map is all, all the annotations are visible. I have a scale bar, I have a cardinal scale. It has my name it in the bottom left. Um, it has my title at the top and it has all the necessary logos and uh, copyright statements on it and a north arrow as well and the date. Um, if I like that, I can then choose to send it to my printer from my web browser. If I didn't like it, I can simply close this tab and start again and try, try again, manipulate things to get them better. You can produce as many of those print files as you like. There is no limit and there is nobody going to stop you doing it. You can keep going until you find the one to get, get what you want out of it. Um, okay, next I want to show you the key which is also in this left-hand panel here. As you can see, you open the key and this is a sort of tree structure which allows you to see all the different uh, categories of features showing on the map here. This is a tree structure with um, opening and closing sections because otherwise it would be so long, it would be really hard to find anything. I'm going to open the top one just to by way of an example. And you can see that as I zoom out and get to a different map, you'll see that the key changes according to the map that you see on the right hand side. You have to keep opening the right sections, but all the different symbols given on the map are all in, in here. As you can see, the annotations become a bit daft as you zoom out because of course they were designed to fit on the scale of the map that I was looking at originally, um, but that's okay. You can go back to the original map and zoom right in and everything will fall back into place. The next thing I want to show you is the grid referencing tool, which is also part of the drawing tools. Grid referencing is a button here, and you'll see that it opens a number of options. You can either leave it set on automatic, in which case, if you click on a space, or click on a, a location, it will give you a grid reference that is appropriate for the scale of the map you're looking at. This is a very detailed map showing all the building outlines and the road pavement edges and so on, and therefore the grid reference is very detailed. That grid reference will stay as it is as I zoom out. But if I was to zoom out to, to start with and do a grid reference at a map of this scale, let's pick this one here, you'll see that I get a much coarser grid reference. Similarly, if I zoom in a bit further and do it again, I'll get a slightly more detailed one and so on. That's what happens on the automatic setting. There may be occasions when you want a very specific grid reference, in which case you can pick any one of these and the grid reference that will appear when you click on a location will be um, set according to that number of digits there. And it won't change as you zoom in and out of the map. We'd be welcome to have feedback on this. This is a fairly new feature for us. So if you have comments on how it works or, or doesn't work for you, then we'd be uh, very interested to hear them. None of these things are set in stone. And if something really doesn't work for you, then we can make changes. Okay, let's look for a minute at saving maps. So let's go back to the map that I drew earlier, which is up here. Let's find my annotations. Zoom in. If I wanted to um, save this map and come back and do some more work on it later, I can use the save map function. That's on the uh, left-hand panel here. It's the little filing cabinet with a star on it. There's a note that I have uh, that I must raise here about data protection. When you save your map, you click here and you give your map a title. My map. We ask you to put class name and pupil name. Those are purely suggestions. You need to put something in these fields. It does not have to be a name and it does not have to be identifying an individual. Um, they are simply guidelines. All you need in here is something that will be able to, that will allow you to retrieve the map at some point in the future and identify it as your particular map. Since everybody in your school logs in under the one username and password, everybody who logs in can see all the maps that are visible in the save map function. This particular map that I've drawn here, we have, for example, a number of people's names and their locations on it. This inevitably raises a data protection issue. Um, if you have a class of children and you're asking everybody to plot their home address on the same map, and that map is then shared, clearly there is a data protection issue there. 
because everybody logs in under the same username and password, there isn't anything we can do about this. We cannot detect that it is personal data in advance. We can't go back and check that the maps for any personal data afterwards either. However, if it's something you are worried about, you can disable the saved maps function completely so that nobody can see anything. Let me save this map here um, to finish this process off and show you how it works. I'm going to put my name in there. I'm just going to click save. And as you can see, the map that I've just saved appears in this left-hand panel. This is the one I did yesterday. So I'm going to replace the drawings. There is the map I drew yesterday. And here is the map I drew just now. So I'm going to click on that one in the left-hand panel, click replace the drawings, and then my map comes back again. There are many other maps here that I've done over the past few, um, few months, and I can go back to any of those at, at any point, and I can still come back to the one that I've drawn here. So if you have um, any concerns about the data protection issue, the way to re remove the save maps function is to use this preferences option in the top right hand corner. There's a drop down arrow next to the title digit for schools. And the first option is edit your preferences. Click on that. You will need to enter your school pin that was issued with your password. If you don't know your school pin, please contact our help desk and we can help you with that. We would suggest that you do not share the pin as widely as you share the password. By all means, give pupils the password. Do not give them the pin because otherwise they will be able to edit all the saved maps and they have it with lots of functions. The hide saved maps tab here, you just slide the toggle across, click save preferences. And when I refresh the map using this start again button, you'll notice that the save maps tab disappears from the left hand panel. That doesn't mean that all your maps have disappeared and been deleted completely. You can retrieve them by adding the save map function back again, which I'll do now to show you how to do it. Go back to edit your preferences, enter your pin code again, click OK, unhide the save maps tab, save preferences, and refresh the map, and the save map tab comes back. Again, I can go back to the save maps that I've done earlier, click on the one that I drew just now, and the full map will come back again. I can, of course, go back to the drawing tools and I can still edit these maps again and I can adjust them. If I want to save them again to save any changes, I will need to save it as a new map. I can't overwrite the existing. OK, so I'm going to delete all the annotations I've got on this map now by using the delete all button. I would also draw your attention to the modify buttons underneath here. If you have selected a feature, these modify buttons become available. I don't have time to go through all those just now. We have a Digibyte session next week, which will go through those. It should only be a 10 or 15 minute session. Uh, do explore them. As I said earlier, you can't get it wrong. Just hit the start again button if you get in a muddle. For now, I'm going to delete all the annotations that I've added and clear them up completely. So I'm going to start again, refresh my map completely. And I'm going to start by showing you the buffer tools, which are in the drawing tools here. It's this button here but I'm going to show you a different uh, location for this. First of all, I'm going to add um, my own data. I have a little file that has London tube stations in it. So I'm going to go to the add your own data button, hit the browse button, find my London tube points, click open and click import. This is a small selection, obviously, of um, tube uh, stations in London with a location and a label. These labels come out quite big, so I'm going to try and make them just a bit smaller. I'm going to add, go back to the drawing tools. And I'm going to click select by box, and I'm going to draw a big box around all the tube stations, and you'll see they all turn yellow. I'm then going to change the text size to be 16 point, not bold, and uh, Verdana. I'm going to leave them black because they're fairly easy to see like that. As I click off those, you can see that the text changes. So somewhere in the middle here, we have St Paul's Cathedral. What I want to know is how many of these tube stations lie within half a mile of St Paul's Cathedral. So I'm going to choose the buffer tool here. I'm going to start with a point buffer. I'm going to enter my buffer radius as 0.5. Actually, you can type anything you like in here. We just give you some straightforward options just to make things a bit easier. I'm going to do half a mile. I'm going to change the settings to be uh, a bright green edge and bright green fill. And then I'm going to click can you see the little blue dot that appears with my cursor? I'm going to click on St Paul's Cathedral, and this will draw me a circle that is half a mile in radius from the point at which I clicked. And from this, of course, I can count exactly how many tube stations are in the area that I've selected. 
So I can zoom in and out on this to show a bit more detail. And the map underneath will change still to reflect the scale of the map that I'm looking at. I can keep going. Do be aware that you can pick this circle up and move it. So if you're panning around with the map, be careful you don't move the circle because you might have to do the buffer zone again. Once the buffer zone is drawn, it effectively acts like a, an annotation that you've just added to map in the same way as you would add any other shape. So it will move about. If I wanted to show the uh, line buffer, I'm going to do the same again. I'm going to pick a line. Maybe I want to know how many um, tube stations there are within half a kilometre of um, the River Thames. So in which case I'm going to use the blue dot again. I'm simply going to draw a line down the middle of the River Thames. Again, I'm just using the click and drag method like this. And when I get to the end of where I want to be, I'm just going to double click and that will draw the buffer zone there. So that gives me an area which is half a mile, oh, sorry, half a kilometre from the line that I've drawn on both sides. So examples of how you might use that might be for um, flooding purposes. If you know that the, when the river floods, the water goes at least a certain distance away from the river, you might want to count how many houses or how many um, animals or how many study sites or how many zones of particular interest might be affected by that flooding. Uh, you could use it with noise pollution along roads. Um, you could use it with um, species that only travel a certain distance from a river or from a particular habitat. There are lots of different options to choose from there. While I'm here, I would like to also show you the map selector. Um, I'm going to show you this button in the top left of the map here. If I click on this, it'll show you what uh, different maps we have available. So within the UK, we have Ordnance Survey maps, which are the contemporary ones. We have aerial photography, which is also contemporary. We also have a 1950s map and an 1890s map. These are both previous versions of OS maps. The reason we have 1890s and 1950s is because those are the two dates for which we can guarantee we have universal coverage across the country. The OS do have other, other maps available. There are different dates, obviously, because there wasn't all map. There was no, there wasn't no mapping going on in between those times but the mapping was done in a very patchy way and therefore finding universal coverage for any given date can be quite tricky and having maps that appear in some places and not in others for a particular date gets very confusing. So we've picked two dates where we know we've got a map for, for every location. The slider along the top here allows you to move seamlessly between the two dates. So I've selected the 1890s map on one side and the contemporary map on the other. And as you can see that, um, that slider allows you to fade between the two. Interestingly then, 1890s, probably all those tube stations were already there. You can look at the area of photography too, which goes into be quite detailed. If we zoom in, we can start to see quite a lot of detail in here too. Uh, let's have a look at a slightly different place here. I'm going to delete all the annotations just for clarity, and I'm going to search for York to show you what happens here. York is an interesting city because it, of course, has grown quite significantly over time. We're looking at the aerial photography there, which is a modern day aerial photography. Um, if we slide back to the 1890s map, you can see that actually York was quite small. I can now use the drawing tools again to let's draw a, I'm going to use the freehand one, just to draw a rough outline. Let's not argue over the particular boundaries of where York used to be. It's just an example. And then if I slide between the contemporary map, the old map and the contemporary map, you can start to see exactly how much York has grown. If I do the same um, outline on the contemporary outline of, of York, you can see that actually the city has got quite a lot bigger. Like this. Again, very happy to be corrected from somebody who knows York better than I do. There we go. And you can start to see how much change there has been over, over time. If we look at the 1950s one, we find that that's, um, there's also a fairly significant increase between the contemporary map and even the 1950s one. So if you're looking at things like the now New Towns Act, 1948, and the growth of um, all the new towns around London, um, this is quite a good way of showing exactly how much urbanisation has, has happened. We do have some learning resources as well on things like coastal erosion, where you can see over time the coast has regressed. Uh, in some places, of course, it's increasing rather than regressing. Um, but there's some learning resources on our website about those too. 
All right, I'm going to delete all those things to start again, and I'm going to show you the geograph images next. Let's just go back to the contemporary maps and zoom in here. I'm going to zoom in on the middle of York because it's a fascinating place. Oops, 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 oops. The geograph image search is this little camera icon on the left-hand side of the, um, the functions panel. Geograph is a website which set out, I think, to create um, a collection of photographs that was intended to represent every one kilometre square in the country. Um, their website is uh, complicated and we have made it slightly easier to access the images by adding them to the map. So um, photographers can, I think anybody can contribute to the Geograph um, archive. Um, all the images are vetted, so they are there are almost no people visible in, in the images at all, apart from crowds. Um, all the images are moderated, so there's chances of something inappropriate getting through are almost zero. Um, the idea is that you search an area and you can search the tags on the photograph for particular things. So if I do a search here, I can either search for everything by putting a star in this search box, and it will come up with a whole range of photographs taken in this area. Clearly, York is a busy place and there are a lot of people who like to take photographs of it. So these um, circles represent the number of photographs that you've got. So if you zoom in, you start to see that the, uh, the photographs separate out into their smaller groups. If you click on a circle like this, you'll see all the images. Click on a thumbnail here and you start to see the whole, um, the whole image itself. If you wanted to search for something more specific, you could search for a particular term. So if I search for church, for example, um, I can sort these according to their age or their title or their most relevant. As I said, the images are tagged by geograph and the photographer, and therefore we don't have any control over what, is, what photographs will appear for a particular search. This just means that you sometimes have to be a bit creative about your search terms. Um, some photographers may just tag everything as place of worship. Some will be very specific and tag it with church or synagogue or um, or, or something different. So just be aware that um, if you don't find what you're looking for, maybe adjust your search term to something that's related and see whether that produces any different results. You can either click on the image itself. So um, the images appear in the left-hand panel here, and that will bring up the thumbnail and show you where they are. And then you can click on the image to blow it up, or you can click on the little camera icons that appear on the map itself and get a, a better image of, of what's there. So we've done adding uh, your own data. Um, we've done the image search. I'd like to show you next the, um, the overlays. So the overlays are a series of data sets that we have curated and put into groups, which will allow you to um, add extra information to the map without doing any sort of processing at all. We just start again, and the overlays are here. So the overlays appear in the left-hand panel here. It's the little layer icon. We've grouped the overlays we've got into different sec sections to just for ease of navigation. When you're looking at uh, the UK like this, you'll find that the GB overlays become active. You have to be looking at it at a particular scale before the, the layers activate, because otherwise you'd, you'd get a um, bit of a daft map sometimes. The obvious one is the British National Grid. This is also linked in the reference grids at the bottom, but it is in fact exactly the same thing. It's just two links to the same, same data set. As you zoom in, of course, this changes, becomes more appropriate for the scale of the map you're looking at. So when you zoom out, you can start to see the curvature of the Earth, which is um, obviously at a smaller scale. As you zoom in, the lines become straighter and the curvature of the Earth takes less, um, has less impact. Keep going and the squares get smaller and allow you to reference, make, do um, grid references a bit more easily. We've got two lines of, of labelling as we go along. And if you keep going, you get to the uh, the maps and some of these maps have the grid lines already printed on them so if i take that off you can see the pale blue grid lines there they form part of the data set itself that os produced once we get to this level you can also add the roads and place names this is very useful if you're looking at the aerial photography um aerial photography is great it's very interesting it's fascinating and you can identify things very easily on it but it still has no labels so we've added the roads and place names labels um, as an overlay to the top so you can identify exactly where you are. 
Similarly, if you're looking at the 1950s map or the 1890s map, it can be quite interesting to have a modern roads and place names layer over the top. You can then start to see what was underneath the M6 before the M6 was built, uh, things like that. Um, I suspect at some point we might look at the HS2 line and see what was under the HS2 line, since that's also going to take up a fairly substantial chunk of land. We also have postcodes. Put that back as a contemporary map. Um, postcodes is an extra layer in this uh, overlays left-hand panel. Click on the postcodes. These two will change according to the scale of the map you're looking at. So if I zoom right out, you can see that what we get is the postcode areas. That's the, the highest level unit. And as we zoom in a bit further, we start to get the postcode districts, which is the uh, yes, yeah, so districts, which is the next level down. Zoom in a bit further still, we start to get to the postcode sectors, which is DN93. And zoom in a little bit further still, and we eventually get to what we call the postcode units, which is the individual postcodes around here. So these are all labelled individually, and you can start to see how they are mathematically calculated rather than following any kind of sensible boundary. Sometimes, especially in cities, you will see little regular squares dotted in the amount of these. These are not mistakes. They are called vertical streets, and they usually represent tall buildings or large buildings that have more than one postcode address in them. So our office block in Edinburgh, for example, has, I think, at least two postcodes in it because it's so big. Um, tower blocks, high rise stories, high, high rise flats often are labelled as vertical streets because say the top five floors have one postcode and the next five floors have another one and so on. A single postcode usually encompasses about 15 different delivery points. Not a hard and fast rule, but it's a it's a good rule of thumb, roughly. So we can take the postcodes off. Um, under the uh, reference grids, you can see, I'm going to zoom right out to cover the world. You can have a look at the, the global ones. So the reference grids are fairly straightforward, so we'll do those next. We have the latitude and longitude grid. This, of course, also changes as you zoom in. So I can zoom in on anywhere in the world, and the latitude and longitude grid will adjust according to the scale of the map I'm looking at. It takes a wee bit of time to do that. Um, you could also add the major lines of latitude, which gives you the equator and the tropics and the Arctic Circle and Antarctic Circle down here. Um, so you might want to have some simple questions to ask, like how many countries um, pass, does the equator pass through? If you wanted to look at the world boundaries here to give you a simpler map, you can change these in the map selector, and then you could count the number of different count countries that the equator passes through. Um, again, in the reference grids at the bottom here, we've also got access to the British National Grid, but that, of course, will only activate once you look over the UK. Going back to the global um, overlays, we have these split into world climate, world human geography and world physical geography. The world climate ones are, um, these are data sets that have come from climate models. So finding out exactly what they mean can be quite complicated. Um, so this is an average temperature between 1970 and 2000, and you can see the, the variation there. Um, but we've also got predicted average minimum temperatures and predicted predicted average maximum temperatures which are also quite interesting so let's take that one off and you can just click these on and off to have a look at them once you've got them on you can then um fade them in and out to start to see the uh the map underneath if that's what you want to do so you can start to look at places that are, are going to be more or less affected by any any climate change. We also have um, the world human geography um, overlays, which are uh, fascinating. This one is my absolute favourite, the population density. Um, you can add these at the same time as the world climate data, and you can start to fade the one and the other to see where the densely populated areas are, and then maybe change that to have a look at where the hot spots are in terms of climate. The population density is a fabulous data set. It shows you the number of people per square kilometer, and you can very quickly see exactly where the pressure is on human habitation. The Sahara Desert clearly is very empty, except for the Nile Delta. So there are lots of questions and conversations to be had about why there. Why is the whole of Egypt, Egypt's population purely in that little line? Um, Northern India is another good example of how people congregate where there is uh, fertile soil and food is plentiful. Um, many, many conversations to be had about distribution of population across 
um, relatively settled areas like Western Europe. And the US is also very interesting. We realize that the US might have 380 million people, but there's still some very large areas with not many people there. It's just a fascinating data set. We also have the world's time zones. Let me just turn the climate ones off. There we go. Uh, the world time zones is also interesting. If you think about going from A to B and how many time zones you might cross. So one interesting thing we observed is that if you were to go from one side of Russia to the other, I think you cross something like eight or nine different time zones. And that's one country. Also a revelation for us when we started looking at this was that there are some countries that have half hour and three quarter hour time zones, which is get must must throw a few people off course, I think. There are also conversations to be had about why countries choose to align their time zone the way they do. So some of the time zone lines across the sea, of course, are straight and they move with, with the sun. Um, but over land, of course, some people are going to not fall in line with that. So Libya here is a good example. Libya probably ought to fall within this plus one time zone, but for some reason it falls within plus two. So why is that? What's the economic advantage? Is there a practical advantage? Is it political? Is there another another factor at play that means they have decided they will be two hours ahead rather than one hour ahead? When it comes to world physical geography, we have some interesting things to do with the world biomes. This is a data set created by the World Wildlife Fund, and I would encourage you to read the more information link in the left hand panel here because it tells you about how they've created them and so on. You can zoom in here. I'd like to show you this get feature info button, which is at the top next to the print button. Click on this and then you can click on the map and it will highlight the area you've clicked on and will give you much more information about the particular world biome in that location. Sometimes you can click on a, an area and you'll find there are more than one biome um, listed. So you can select any one of these and it will give you the details of each one. Um, as you zoom in, of course, that becomes um, it becomes easier to identify particular, um, particular zones. I need to turn that off in order to go back to activating the overlays panel here. We also have um, mountain ranges, volcanoes, tectonic plates and tectonic plate boundaries. The volcanoes are fascinating here. It's unfortunate that given the underlying map is a single image was focused on uh, Western Europe, um, we do in fact pan to the edge of the world and we can pan the other way to the other edge of the world, which just means we can't really see the full um, effect of the Pacific Ring of Fire. You get it in two halves. So here's the Western half here and here's the Eastern half here. Zooming in on any of these um, little triangles and volcanoes, you can use the feature info button at the top again to click on any volcano and it will give you information about it. it tells you about the volcano's name, its type and its last eruption date and so on. Um, some of them of course are um, not active and some of them are very active and this information is contained in this button here. If you were to add the tectonic plate boundaries and the volcanoes all at the same time, you can start to see a coincidence there. The plate boundaries will also tell you whether they are convergent, divergent, subducting or transforming, um, if that's what you would like to focus on. Um, if you didn't want just the boundaries, you can have the plates themselves as well. And these have an, a, a transparency slider on them as well, so you can get a much better idea of what, what areas are covered by which plates. Something off. The mountain ranges also um, show, uh, show up quite usefully with the tectonic plate boundaries and you can start to see exactly where the world's significant mountain ranges are. That concludes the overlays, I think. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a bit to answer any more questions, any questions if people have some, and if there's something you'd like me to repeat or show you again, I'm happy to do that. Um, other than that, that's pretty much everything for now.